So good morning. I'm Jorge Lozando. How are you guys? Technical difficulties. <laughs> Ira, Jean, help. Uh, Annalisa has them on the flash drive. Do you have them? Okay, great. So uh, we'll take a couple minutes just to load the presentation, but let me kind of set up a little bit of why I'm even here. Uh, you guys are clearly the experts in education. What is somebody in the grocery business doing anything with uh, education, right? Makes a lot of sense. That was a good question. Um, so basically, about a year and a half ago, um, I was asked by Madi to join the board of Gentex, uh, largely because she believes in having working people on her board, i.e. you can't just sit and give an opinion, she doesn't allow it. Um, so one of the things that she did is she needed somebody to look at data and education data and help Gentex kind of uh, look at uh, what we were going to do. In doing so, I ended up uh, working with folks like Annalisa, who work on my research staff at HEB, and looking at education data. And to say that it's complicated is a complete understatement. Um, and uh, you guys uh, have a ton of data, and the data is not linked, and it's hard to work through. And you know, we at HEB depend on data. That is our lifeline on, uh, on basically how we make decisions. Um, and uh, I'll tell you that uh, easy data is the best way to go, and uh, education data is anything but easy, uh, is what I have found. And uh, that's where you guys live. So what I thought we'd do today is, as uh, I talked to Gene and others on what we were doing with SA 2020 and we looked at the, at the numbers, um, you know, there's a huge mountain that we need to climb. And at the end, I'll give you some hopefully inspirational messages as to why we should climb that mountain. Um, and, uh, but I thought what we would do today is just kind of go through a little bit of the data on, and I'm going to focus specifically on SAT, ACT. So you have a ton of data that you brought in today that you're going to be focused on over the, the course of the day. Uh, but it just, I'd like to kind of talk about three principles that as we look at data at HEB, we keep in mind and then I try to put those into the SAT data is basically what I ended up doing, okay? So uh, to begin with, you know, when I looked at uh, what we were doing with SA 2020, the education vision that we talked about, San Antonio has orchestrated one of the greatest turnarounds in education in the United States. That is the truest statement I've ever seen. Uh, but there's multiple pillars behind that, multiple planks. And today what we're going to focus on is really the data that I have is around college readiness. Um, even though, you know, there's a lot of other things that we need to work on. Number four, increase high school graduation rates, i.e., look at our dropout rates. That's another big issue that, uh, that as we look at data through Gentex is so important. Uh, so what we've uh, set as our goal is 85% of students will demonstrate college readiness in one of three ways. Uh, the three basic components that uh, have been outlined is completing the recommended high school diplomas. Number two, achieving a college ready score on SAT or ACT. And then number three, passing or completing at least one course uh, for college credit. So really what I'd like to talk is a little bit about the, the spirit of what we're trying to do here. So clearly you guys in, in education, what we need to do is have our workforce to be college or career ready. And so not everybody has to go to a four-year university, uh, but folks need to have a career path. And as an employer, I'll tell you that uh, we're counting on you guys to give us uh, folks that are ready to go into at least the basic levels of, of, uh, of work, and then it's up to us to help build on that on what we need them specifically to do in our different, uh, in our different um, jobs. Uh, but as we look at the data, here are the three basic things that I always focus on at HEB on our data, and I applied it a little bit here on the three standards. The first one is on de-averaging. So when you look at 85% uh, is the target for having high school diplomas uh, completed, um, the, the different school districts range between 79 and 90, right? So um, when, we look at, uh, when we look at something like the SAT or ACT scores being at a college ready criteria, so 1100 or higher on the SAT, for example, um, we have a range in our city where we have from 3% of the kids, so these are of the test takers, to 56%. The second line on there that goes from 1 to 51, what that is is of all high school grads, right? So there's a, this is the second theme, is around uh, basically common language. So common language would say, as we start measuring some of these, as you start looking at your data today, defining this common language. So when we look at something like percent of students that are graduated, that have an 11, 10 or higher on SATs, if you look at it from uh, those that took the test, or you can look at it from those that are graduating from, uh, from your entire senior class, right? So as you look at moving your measures, just developing common language e even amongst the four school districts on how we want to look at this for SA 2020 becomes important, right? 
And then the third uh, example here on passing or completing at least one college course for uh, college credit. Again, the range in the city in the theory of deaveraging goes from 12% to 50%. So different districts sit in different areas. And then on your high school campuses, you'll know that those range as well, right? So as you look at your own district, deaveraging within the district becomes important uh, for those with multiple high school campuses. Um, the sec so first, the average, second, common language as an example number two, which is, you know, let's make sure we all agree on what we're going to measure, but let's not get overly caught up in putting check marks and boxes on did we hit the, hit the uh, you know, hit the score, right? Uh, basically, let's look at the intent of what we're trying to do with SA 2020, and it really is about preparing our children to be college or career ready. The numbers for, for this year in terms of how many student, how many folks in our workforce require post-secondary degrees is 32%. Of that, 10% of that is made up from folks that uh, require two years or certificate programs, 22 from those that require four years or above. And so how do we work towards that? Projections for uh, 2020, if you hold everything constant, goes up to about 33, 34%, not a big jump. What we're trying to do in San Antonio is take that to 50%. We're trying to bring in industries, we're trying to build our infrastructure, have the collective impact that moves us to 50%, but we need the workforce to be able to support what we're trying to do, which is recruit folks to come in and work in the city uh, that, that have those, um, those jobs as well that, that have great lives for our, for our citizens, okay? So any questions on this? Seems kind of an odd way to look at it, but these are the three basic principles that we live at uh, or live by in terms of data, the averaging common language and intent. And so when I was talking to, um, to Gene just about the whole idea that we're trying to go from, uh, basically, we have, we have a real problem with how many of our kids are college ready. In terms, Some districts down at uh, three to one percent, depending on how you look <coughs> at it. Um, that's a real problem. I graduated from South End, I'll tell you, we're not at the uh, top of that <coughs> scale. Uh, and uh, I live in SAISD, and I'll tell you that I, you know, I'm very passionate about the fact that we, we need some work there as well. Um, but as we kind of look at the turnaround, I you know, started working with uh, Madi and, and Gentex and said, can we really do it? And Gene, uh, Gene said, you know, there's big, bold numbers. You know, we need to get this done. And here's kind of what inspires me. This is just an example. Uh, every district has great examples that they can put up here. This is an example of a conversation we had with Dr. King down at PSJA because I was trying to understand some of the basic principles and have him educate me on some of the ba basic <coughs> principles of what he was working on. And when you look at something like, this is just an example of his four-year dropout rate. Um, when he first took over, it was 18.7. Basically, as you kind of look at it, uh, five years later, it's down to 2.9. So he was more than double the state average, and now he's more than half <coughs> the state average. And I thought, that's really interesting. How did you get there, right? And in conversations, what he said was, it's pretty easy. It's not rocket science per se. He said, it's focus. And that's really the, the, the kind of fourth theme. It really is around, today, you know, you guys as, as uh, folks who are running our schools have a ton of things that are being required of you. You know, and it is not hard to say at, you know, at the end of the day, where, where did my day go? You know, I was working on tons of stuff. Um, and what was interesting, what we do at HEB and what really resonated with me on what he was doing with his district was he had a real focus on a few things, right? And then folks could rally around it. So as you think of SA 2020, as you think of, you know, high school completion with kids that are college and career ready, as you think of kids who are ready to take the SATs, who are gonna do well when they take the SATs, if they're gonna go to four-year institution, the real, the, the real fo uh, discussion today is about how do we put some basic plans in place and how do we have focus around those plans? Because you have a ton of things to do, but how do you prioritize this as a focus? And that becomes important. I was pretty impressed with his numbers, not because of the numbers themselves, but because of the fact that, you know, we at HEB do this all the time. We know we have a bunch of problems uh, and we can go work on every single problem a little bit at a time, but we try to take our entire team and focus on something that we know is really monumentally important. So why are you guys here today? For lots of reasons, but here's the part that I love. You guys uh, cumulatively in this room, four districts cumulatively touch 56% of the lives of our students in San Antonio today. So big impact can happen by you four uh, really uh, putting plans in place and then from there being able to emulate that through the rest of the city, but you alone touch 56%. And you alone touch 62% of the Hispanic kids in our city today. And so again, great impact, demographics are changing, I'll tell you, it was interesting when I looked at some demos for the state of Texas. Today our population is about 25 million in the state of Texas. In 2040, the Hispanic population for Texas will be 25 million. So when you think of like just the growth that the Hispanic population will be having over the next you know, 20, 30 years, it's a pretty monumental. And so again, um, we, we have a, a pretty good control in the education of Hispanic students in the city through these four districts. 
So what I thought I'd do next is just take one of the basic metrics. Again, you brought a ton of data today to look at, uh, but one of the basic metrics around uh, SAT scores. And so when we look at the city of San Antonio for the class of 2010, uh, basically there's about 15,500 grads uh, for the class of 2010. Of those, 62% of those uh, students took uh, the SAT or the ACT, basically just uh, shy of 10,000. And uh, roughly 24% of those who took it, or 23, 28, uh, ended up scoring either 1,100 or higher on the SAT or 24 or higher on the ACT. So the way that you kind of look at that, and again, back to common language, if I kind of looked at, uh, of all my graduates in the city of San Antonio, 15% are basically scoring at a, at a point that we think they're probably ready to go to a institution where their first semester will be a successful semester alone. What's interesting in the data, and just playing through this, is that when we've looked at the data at the macro level that says from 100 ninth graders, how many drop out for the city, how many then persist to a two or four year institution, how many come out of the back end, that number is 18%. Not surprising how close these two numbers are. You know? So again, two to four year institution, 18%, kids that are ready on SAT, ACT, 15%. So a pretty decent uh, indicator, I if you think of it. The movement here would be, uh, would be useful for us. Um, but it does give you two things. So again, as you decompose your problem, the real question is, decomposing this problem, I would look at it and say, you know, where do we want to affect this? We want to affect it in two places. Number one is we can affect it on kids taking the test, and you guys have worked uh, uh, on those kind of programs before. Um, do you want to have 100% taking the test? Who knows? But I'll tell you, go back to intent. What you want is that 23, uh, the 23, 28 to go up. So you really want to affect what do we have in place to help the students with the exams really pass those exams at a good rate, right? So you just don't want more students taking exams and not really moving that number up. But uh, really, how do we work on both of those together? And this might be how you want to attack it, maybe a completely different way. You'll figure out what's right for your district. You'll figure out uh, what's right for your students. Uh, but as you kind of decompose your, pro uh, your, your numbers, they'll kind of point out to these kind of two, uh, two areas of opportunity. Um, so what, uh, what this is basically is looking now at the SAT scores uh, for all of the districts in the city of San Antonio. And uh, what, th what this specifically looks at is the kids that are taking the SAT. So if you look at somebody like Alamo Heights, 86% of the students are taking the, the SAT. Um, the trend is basically kind of flat. As you look at the districts today, uh, in our here today, uh, Northside at 60%, uh, San Antonio ISD at 54, Harlandale at 47, and Southwest at 44. I'll tell you what, given what we need in terms of workforce, and if you kind of go back to the whole idea of 32% today, 50% in the future, um, the, the, a very hopeful community. Our kids are very hopeful. They end up taking the test, they want to go somewhere, they're really spending their time here. You know, folks are really guiding them towards taking the test. Um, the trends uh, tend to go up and down a bit, but uh, again, this number can be worked on as we de-average it. Uh, South End, where I graduated, 38% of the kids. Um, but these are the, these are the scores for those uh, same districts. So if you look at Alamo Heights, um, basically the average score is 1122. And if you look at the percent of the students that scored over 1110, that's 56 percent. And then you just kind of scan the list, and I'll talk about South Sand because since I graduated from there, I don't think there'll be any hard feelings. Um, uh, South Sand's average, 879, and uh, 3 percent of the students graduated at over 1110. So when we look at this, what's interesting, and you guys know this, is the school districts differently are different sizes, so we'll get to that in two seconds. Uh, but what we did is we said, okay, if we look at the percent of students that are, go, uh, that are scoring 11, 10 or higher, and we t look at the percent of those that took the test, multiply those out together, and here's kind of what you get. So to read Alamo Heights, 56% of the kids uh, scored over criteria, 86% uh, of the kids who are graduating took the test. So 48% of their graduating class, back to common language, 48% of their graduating class are scoring at 11, 10 or higher. Okay. As you kind of continue this, the school districts have different sizes. So there's that 15,000 at the bottom, which is everybody we graduated in 2010 for the city, right? So if you kind of look at this materially, just, you know, the, the example for this is to say, if you kind of take Randolph Field at 68 uh, kids and you said, let's double that, that's going to have a different impact if you took Northside and said, let's even get half of that more, right? So as we kind of look at this and go back to intent, our intent is to have more educated population in the city of San Antonio that can take more rigorous jobs and therefore command a higher salary and therefore have the collective impact that we're ha uh, hoping to do. So Jose, may I interrupt sure, you? please. So are we concluding that the non-test takers have not otherwise caused a 
We're not concluding they're not college ready, but I'll tell you that the, it, the data would not suggest that they're going to be the ones that are most college prepared. Yeah. You guys are welcome to have a conversation on that. You guys are the experts in this field, not me. I'm looking at the data. You guys know the details, right? Comments? Yes. Um, so basically, um, so when we're looking at um, when we're looking at today, those are, so those are, sorry, so the, the first number, the 15,494, those are the number of kids uh, that, that are graduating. The last ones are the ones that are graduating at Criteria. That's basically it. So here's kind of the summary of the city. So if you look at today, if you look at the number of students that are graduating, that 13%, number of students that, are gra uh, that have taken the SAT, ACT, scoring at Criteria or higher, that's 13%. If we wanted to move the 85%, which we, we know we've set up the 85% at SA 2020 as an or, not an and, right? But if you wanted to live into a bold kind of idea that says you pick your, great question, you pick your index of what you think is going to be college and career ready for the students, uh, for your district, and you set that number up at 85%. In this case, I've taken the SATs, right? So basically, in order to say that our graduating seniors are college and career ready in 2020 at 85%, that would mean that we'd have 13,000 grads who have taken the SAT and who have scored at 1,100 uh, or higher. It's a huge mountain to climb. If you guys, you know, the daily part of this, this is easy on numbers, not easy in reality, right? But that's 11,000 kids. But what this shows you is you, you have to know the number and then attack that number is basically what, it, what I'm trying to advocate for, right? So as you sit down with your data today, you decide what it means to be college and career ready. Yes, we have it as an or, uh, the graduation uh, diploma type or SAT or having taken dual or college credit before graduating. But the intent of that is to have a, a populace that's college and career ready. You guys can decide those metrics and then just kind of decide how many students you need to get there. So that's kind of the way that I would suggest you look at the data. It's just basically say how many more kids do we need to, every time we, every time we see our graduating class, what is it that we have as our criteria that says we're living into the SA 2020 bold bold dream that says we're not just going to live going from 32 to 33 in 2020. We're going to have a massive change in our city where we have a college and career ready group that then end up taking jobs that allow them to have a great wage and live a great life. And we happen to know that our population is predominantly Hispanic, so we happen to know that we are just changing the, the dynamics of the Hispanic population. Okay? The, um, the reasons that basically uh, this matters. So basically, how can we increase the testing rate for SAT exams? Kind of what we talked about. The three focuses at the bottom is kind of what I'd like for, for you to take away from, which is de-average the data. Never look at your average data. I, I found that early on in my career at HB, I used to do that. It was really painful to later come back and go, you don't see as many problems as when you start de-averaging it by campus or by, by district <coughs> or by so forth. Uh, average to the common language. Make sure that you agree on what the common language is, because if not, you're going to spend so much time arguing on whether your number is right or wrong or whether you've hit it or not, right? But then also, you know, um, make sure that you're, you're focused on the fact that uh, there's a head count behind this. We're not really looking at just percentages. We, we at HEB say you don't take percentages to the bank, you take money to the bank. You know, same kind of thing. You don't take percentages to college, you take kids to college. <coughs> you know. uh, so why is this really important? This, this is kind of what, this is what inspires me as to why we would want to do this. If you look at the top line, uh, this is for the state of Texas unemployment through 2006 to 2012 with our bad uh, recession in the middle. Um, and if you look at the top line, less than high school degrees, <coughs> you'll notice that they always have the highest unemployment rate in the state of Texas, right? This is pretty true for the nation, by the way. Uh, if you look at your second line, that's high school graduate, no college. If you look at the third line, some college or associate's degree. And if you look at your fourth line, the bottom line, that's bachelor's degree or higher. So there's an there's a, there's a interesting balance, an interesting yin for yang that basically says we need kids with uh, degrees, we need, we need businesses that need that skilled labor force. So there's, the city's working on multiple fronts here, but, uh, but this is impactful data that says if you have a college degree, you have more choices and it seems like your unemployment rate tends to stay lower. Right? This I thought was really, uh, really important for the state of Texas. 35% of the Texas students going to college are the first in their families to go to college. So you're dealing with uniquely different situations uh, than folks whose parents can help guide them through it, right? I come from where my mom has a sixth grade education from Mexico, my dad has an eighth grade education from Mexico. They don't speak much English. Um, what they do speak, many times I have to kind of go like, what are you talking about? That's not even right. Um, 
but uh, but basically the you know so them guiding me through college was not easy. Um, I'll tell you just like uh, the previous speaker, there was a teacher who really transformationally did that for me, um, and she was the one who basically said you must go to college. And I'll tell you she did a nice job. I ended up going to Yale undergrad, Stanford grad, um, and uh, from South End. So uh, but I'll tell you this is this is an important thing that you guys are dealing with, but important as we think of getting these kids into college. This is uh, important. 53% of the Texas children living in poverty came from a family with less than a high school education. So back to, uh, back to basically the, the entire loop of how this all works. This kind of breaks your heart. 33% of the juveniles sent to Texas Youth Commission are dropouts. And more importantly, 80% of the Texas inmates are dropouts. Yeah, that really breaks your heart. This is, uh, we're in the food business. This is important <laughs> to us. 38% of those with less than a high school, uh, high school degree are obese. Only 22% of those with a college degree are. You know, so we're, we're working on healthy at HEB and healthy in our communities. Um, you know, education is a fundamental part of this as well. And this, uh, this, this ultimately speaks to the importance in impacting lives. 75, uh, 75 is the expected life expectancy of those with high school or less. 82 is the expected life expectancy of college-educated folks. Okay, so that's kind of what motivates into saying this isn't just a fun numbers game uh, for folks who love numbers like myself. Um, this really is about this is about the population, it's about our neighbors and our kids. Okay. That's what I have today. Thank you for letting me be up here. Appreciate it.